that the best the best thing going forward is to ask as many questions as possible and to not to make assumptions going forward. So that's why it's important for the next step. And I think that Dr. Brian will be able to inform us really about the next steps, which is how do we understand suicide? How do we understand um, what we think now and whether we should re-examine what we think about it? Uh, the rates continue to go up. Uh, the, the, the rates are worse amongst our minorities uh, for sure uh, and those who are marginalized in general. Um, so I'm really lucky that Dr. Brian is part of our faculty. He directs our division on recovery and resilience. He directs our suicide prevention and suicide program. We are really lucky for him to have us uh, have him here. Dr. Brian received his uh, doctorate degree at Baylor University. He then completed his residency at the Wilford Medical Center and the Lachlan Air Force Base in Texas. He then was retained there as a faculty member in the Department of Psychology at Wilford, where he was Chief of Primary Care Psychology, as well as Suicide Prevention Program Manager at the Lachlan Air Force Base. He then was deployed to Iraq, so he's one of our veterans. There he served as Director of Traumatic Brain Injury uh, at the Air Force Theater there in Iraq. He separated from active duty shortly after uh, and has joined a couple of universities. While he was at the University of Utah, prior to joining us, he directed the Center for Veteran Studies um, and has been sort of a national leader in this space, which is a nice combination of three really relevant areas, uh, trauma, veterans, and suicide, which I think when I met uh, Dr. Brett, uh, Dr. Ryan, I felt that it was an amazing opportunity to recruit him to our department to bring us forward. He's very published in this area, over 20 scientific articles, having had a number of innovative strategies to bring us forward in this space. So I'm really glad that he's here. He's a well-known, uh, active, engaged uh, psychologist and investigator in this space. So um, I I'm really grateful to have him as a part of our faculty member uh, in the department and really as the face of suicide prevention for the department and for the Ohio State University. And with that, uh, we're looking forward to welcoming Dr. Brian to the stage and, and uh, looking forward to his talk. Thanks, Craig. Well, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Fon, for that introduction. I'm uh, glad to be with you all today to um, share some uh, newer work uh, related to suicide prevention that uh, we've been focusing on uh, my research program. Um, uh, and we've been building upon that here since my arrival at The Ohio State University last year. So um, let me go ahead and get started. So just uh, my disclosures here on the screen, um, I have multiple grants, um, consulting arrangements and royalties. Um, I, I think the uh, the relationship that's most relevant for what uh, I'll be talking about in this presentation is uh, royalties from Oxford University Press. I'll be um, addressing a number of issues in a, a new forthcoming book that's published by Oxford. So I, I want to begin today with a story. Um, it's a story of a scientist named Abraham Bald. During World War II, U.S. planes launched from Britain often returned from missions riddled with bullet holes resulting from anti-aircraft fire. These are the lucky ones. Many planes did not return at all. To minimize these losses, the U.S. military decided to add more armor to their planes, thereby providing greater protection from anti-aircraft fire. The problem was that extra armor increases the plane's weight which requires more fuel to fly the same distance or the removal of bombs and ammunition to offset that weight. So to balance the need for increased protection without adding too much weight to the plane, military leaders decided to concentrate the armor in the most vulnerable sections of the planes rather than covering the entire plane with extra armor. So the question they had was which sections of the planes should we focus on? So the Navy conducted a study. In that study, researchers modeled the average density of bullet holes observed among returning planes. 
And they found that the average number of bullet holes per square foot was not uniform across the returning planes. Uh, they found specifically that the fuselage in the fuselage section, more bullet holes per square foot were observed in these sections here as compared to the engines as well as other sections of the plane. So based on these results, the military concluded that it would be more effective to add extra armor to these high density areas as compared to these lower density areas. Uh, the rationale was that these high density bullet areas were clearly the sections of the plane that were sustaining the greatest amount of damage. And so therefore they needed the most protection. In the end, however, the military did the exact opposite. They added extra armor to these lower density, less damaged portions of the plane as compared to those blue circled sections that I showed you before. So why would they do this? Why would they armor up the sections that seemed to have the least amount of damage? Well, that change, that approach was influenced by Abraham Wald. Uh, Wald identified a critical error in the reasoning of the researchers and military officers who were charged with finding a solution that could reduce the number of downed planes and save more lives. At the outset of the Navy study, the only planes included in the study were those that make it, made it back from a mission, so the survivors. The planes that were shot down in enemy airspace or did not make it back to base were not included in the study because they were missing. They had not survived the mission and they were therefore invisible or unseen to the researchers. Bald recognized this error and introduced into the military's logic the concept of survival bias. And he asked a somewhat different question. Why do some sections of the plane have fewer bullet holes than others? Wald based this question on the assumption that all sections of the plane should be equally vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. All the sections of the plane therefore should have a similar number of bullet holes, but they don't. Wald realized that the missing bullet holes were on the planes that did not make it back. The reason the engines on the surviving planes had fewer bullet holes per square foot wasn't because this was where the planes were least vulnerable, it was because this was where the planes were most vulnerable. If a plane's engine was shot and damaged, it was much more likely to lose power and fuel and not be able to return home. If, however, a plane's fuselage was shot and damaged, there was still a chance that the plane could make it back home. So if the Navy wanted to increase the number of planes coming home and the number of lives saved, they needed to think about what could not be seen rather than what was sitting right in front of them. So Vald eventually convinced the Navy to see things from this perspective and the recommendation was put into place. Extra armor was concentrated in the engine sections instead of the fuselage and it worked. Fewer planes were shot down, many lives were saved. Now, of course, the strategy did not save every plane and every life, but it made an enormous difference. Now, if we think about that, imagine what would have happened if the researchers and military leaders had pushed forward with their original plan to armor up the sections with many bullet holes. Well, they almost certainly would have seen little to no change in lives saved, even though they probably would have seen fewer bullet holes in these sections of the newly returned planes. And so perhaps the smaller number of bullet holes in these armored sections of the returning planes would have led the researchers and the leaders to conclude the extra armor works. It works because we don't see as many bullets. But that wouldn't have necessarily changed the number of planes being shot down, and so they probably would have been pretty confused. You know, if the planes have fewer bullet holes, why aren't we saving more lives? And so it's quite possible at that point that researchers and military leaders would have recommended to put even more armor on those same sections, hoping that even more protection would do the trick. But this too would have proven futile. 
And so they could have become stuck in this endless cycle of armoring up the wrong sections of the plane without any change in outcomes, without saving any more lives, on and on indefinitely, just continuing to befuddle and confuse everybody involved. I, I start with this story because I, I would argue that in many respects, uh, we're in a similar position when it comes to suicide prevention. Um, that a lot of what we have attempted uh, to, as our approach for saving lives and preventing suicide, on the whole, doesn't necessarily seem to be working as you know, overall trends over the past several decades have suggested. The rates in general have continued to climb, even though we have done more and more of the same strategies. This would suggest that something isn't quite landing, something isn't adding up. And so what I wanted to talk about today was that maybe we need to fundamentally rethink how we approach suicide prevention, uh, because very clearly the approaches that we have been taken uh, for at least a few decades aren't really getting us the results that we would like, even though in some respects we're seeing some indicators that things might be working, but it doesn't seem to translate into lives saved. And so there are a few examples of so-called new strategies that I would argue do not fundamentally change our approach to suicide prevention. Um, a, a few of these are, for instance, new screening tools or so-called new screening tools that ask about suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, the, the most popular being the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Um, I would argue that these, this new scale does not actually change anything about screening because we're still asking about suicidal thoughts and suicidal behaviors. We're just using a different form to get at the same concept. Um, I, I would argue that um, uh, the same critique applies to predictive analytics uh, based on machine learning and artificial intelligence that are taking information from medical record data and combining it in complex new ways in an attempt to better identify those who are at risk for suicide. Uh, but here again, I say it's not fundamentally changing things because it's taking the same information and taking the same variables that we've had for a long time and just resorting them in a different way. And then another example that I'll spend a little time talking about is a strong emphasis on short-term management of risk um, at the expense of longer term treatment and intervention. And um, I think the hallmark of that is the nearly exclusive emphasis on uh, safety planning and other very brief short term management types of approaches without really adequately addressing longer term treatments that reduce chronic persisting suicide risk. And so I want to talk about uh, several key areas uh, that we might consider rethinking when it comes to suicide prevention. The first I want to talk about is the, the notion of warning signs. Now, by definition, warning signs for suicide must come before the suicide attempt actually occurs. That's the whole concept of a warning sign, that it precedes or serves as an indicator of the event that's about to occur. Now, although warning signs by definition are, would come before suicidal behavior, this does not necessarily mean that warning signs are always useful as an alert system for intervention. Indeed, it's possible that some suicides are not preceded by detectable or meaningfully, meaningfully useful warning signs at all. In some cases, warning signs may reflect a change process that's already underway. In other words, by the time we observe the warning sign, it may be too late. And so as an example of that, I wanna show a brief video to kind of display uh, this concept. And so this is just, I, I think like about a 30 or 45 second video um, of, a, of an athlete that everyone probably recognizes, uh, Simone Biles, uh, who's very, very accomplished um, at her work. Um, and so let's just go ahead and watch this and talk about how this gymnastics example, uh, what we might learn from it about this notion of suicide warning signs. <laughs> 
point. So I, sh I showed this video because we can see here a warning sign of the imminent fall of the imminent event. That warning sign is uh, her leg, her left leg. It suddenly shoots out to the side. Um, and in that moment, we immediately know that she's lost her balance. The leg movement results from that balance being lost at that point, the fall is already occurring. By the time we see the leg movement, there's really not much that can be done to prevent it or to intervene. Even if we were, for example, a spotter and we were standing right next to, uh, right next to uh, the balance beam, it happens so quickly, this fall, that by the time we register uh, that she has lost her balance, she's already on the floor and we probably would not be able to do anything to intervene. Now, this is not always the case. Warning signs can sometimes occur far enough in advance to be useful and meaningful. However, there are many times where the warning signs do not come far enough in advance. And I think what this means for suicide prevention is that we need to hedge our bets a lot more around this concept of warning signs and how we, uh, how we disseminate information and educate the public about uh, warning signs. Uh, critically, I, I would argue that our approach in suicide prevention is based on the assumption that warning signs can always be seen and that warning signs can, by default, occur far enough in advance that they can give us enough time to actually intervene or prevent suicide. I think the consequence of this is that oftentimes those left behind in the aftermath of suicide, family members, friends, coworkers, clinicians, and others um, often experience guilt and shame. They can blame themselves when in reality, what, we, what might be happening is just that there wasn't enough information or the information, once it became available, was simply not enough, uh, did not allow enough time for an intervention uh, to be uh, provided. And so there, there may even be some cases where warning signs actually signify the process that's already occurring, such that it's not a precursor or cause of suicide, so much as that the warning sign is suicide has already started to occur, and so it's more of a signal of the change process in and of itself. And so uh, I think uh, an important part is not only um, changing and rethinking how we educate the public about the notion of warning signs, uh, but I think it has significant implications um, for affecting the well-being and health of, like I said, those, those key survivor groups who are left behind. Now, a, a second um, idea that I want to talk about is the notion of moving beyond cutoff scores um, and our nearly exclusive focus on suicidal ideation as one particular warning sign for suicide, um, and in, in, at least in clinical settings, as the primary method for identifying those who are at risk for suicide. Now, I would, I would argue that this, uh, this graphic on the screen right now is uh, quite possibly uh, one useful way of organizing most of the contemporary theories of suicide, where there's some sort of a linear progression of escalating risk, whereby a person begins by wanting to die or feeling that their life doesn't have much meaning or purpose. Um, and then they transition to a stage where they actively think about suicide. And then they start to develop some suicidal intent. Um, and then they start to develop specific plans about how or when they're going to attempt suicide, and then the behavior actually occurs. Um, and most of our screening methods right now in healthcare settings is really basically fundamentally based on this presumed linear progression through higher risk states. The problem is that we actually have a pretty good amount of data that there are multiple pathways to suicide. Um, and, and evidence for this has existed for several decades, but we've largely sort of talked our way out of it or ignored the implications of this. Um, and so there might be different roads that a person takes to suicide attempt. And 
Interestingly, there may even be some pathways that do not involve any form of suicidal ideation, at least as we have traditionally conceptualized or defined suicidal ideation. These might be those cases that sort of qualitatively we experience as coming out of the blue, occurring suddenly, or um, as many family members and uh, other loss survivors uh, often say is this was the last person we would have expected um, to, to die by suicide. Um, all of this suggests that there might be different ways to get to suicidal behavior, which if true, would require us to significantly rethink how we approach screening, assessment, and intervention. So one of, one of the concepts that we've been working on, for instance, um, in our research here at OSU is looking at the inherently dynamic nature of suicide risk. Um, it's kind of interesting what we're finding is that suicidal thinking and other indicators of risk um, will actually fluctuate, sometimes very, very rapidly. Uh, we, we use methodology now called Ecological Momentary Assessment, or EMA, where we can have uh, research participants or patients download smart, uh, smartphone apps, and then we can send surveys to them multiple times per day to check in where are you at and what are you doing and how are you feeling and are you having thoughts about suicide? And what those research studies using that method Methodology has shown us is that suicidal ideation and suicide risk fluctuates sometimes dramatically within the span of a few hours. And so we get these time courses that are very similar to the graphic on the screen right now. And so what this means from like a clinical or prevention perspective, if, if we were to uh, say here that uh, we have one person uh, depicted with the black line, a second person depicted by the red line, and this is their sort of natural fluctuation in suicide risk on a moment to moment basis, or maybe a day to day basis. If these two individuals were to show up, say, in an emergency department at the point in time corresponding to the arrow on the left, what we would probably conclude is that uh, the person depicted in red is lower risk than the person depicted in black. If, however, those same two individuals showed up to the same emergency department at a time corresponding to the arrow on the right, we would, we would draw the exact opposite conclusion. Here, we would say the person in black is lower risk than the person in red. Now, of course, if we look at the overall time span, they really don't differ from each other at all. And this is actually one of, this seems to be one of the key reasons why our typical approaches to suicide risk screening are so notoriously unreliable. Um, it's because the construct itself, suicidal ideation, uh, suicidal urges, fluctuates so much, it's so inherently dynamic that when we ask someone to fill out a particular form or to report um, their thought processes or their behaviors within a specified window of time, we might not actually be capturing the entire phenomenological experience of suicide risk as it naturally ebbs and flows over the course of time. Um, and so I think uh, future directions in suicide prevention, for instance, really need to first recognize this limitation. I, I think um, we, we vastly minimize the limitations of existing suicide risk screening methods. And as a field, we've largely promoted expanded and wider and wider um, use of suicide prevention screening, um, sort of pushing under the rug the fact that it's really not actually very reliable. Um, and due to that unreliability, there might actually be consequences to um, having wrong or incorrect screening results and what might that also be um, and how might that also impact suicide risk for individual patients and people um, who are incorrectly flagged by those screening methods. Now, we've, we've been building then on this concept of, um, uh, of fluctuations in suicide risk to see if we can come up with better methods for identifying vulnerable uh, patients and individuals. And one of the ways that we've looked at this is to use more advanced and sophisticated mathematical models um, to capture and describe these change processes over time. And what we've shown thus far, not only in our research, but other labs are now replicating 
this as well, is that there are these two temporal signals that seem to be better at signifying increased vulnerability to suicidal behavior as compared to the traditional cutoff score method that many of us have uh, used and are still using right now in clinical practice. Um, the, first, uh, the first change pattern that seems to be really useful is on top. What you see here is that on the left-hand side of this time series, um, you see fluctuations in suicide risk. Um, and then at about the halfway point, you'll see that those fluctuations increased in amplitude. So the ups and downs are much larger and more pronounced. That increased amplitude we've been able to show is one possible indicator that suicidal behavior is starting to emerge. A person is about to shift to a higher risk state. The second pattern that we've seen is depicted on the bottom of this slide, where we see, again, uh, fluctuations in suicide risk uh, with an occasional spike. That might be, for instance, a suicidal crisis or episode that emerges but then quickly resolves. Then at about the halfway point, we see those spikes, uh, those crises start happening with much, much greater frequency. Um, so increased frequency is another uh, indicator that we have seen. And so what this means is that I think the future of suicide prevention uh, will, I think, help many of us working in behavioral health and psychiatric settings, especially like outpatient uh, settings, where we can start to uh, repeatedly assess suicide risk, suicidal ideation, and other risk factors, say, for instance, at every single visit, at every single session, and start looking at these ups and downs. And maybe there are different types of up and down patterns um, that would be a better indicator of emerging suicide risk, which, would, which could then alert us clinicians to potentially change the treatment plan to better target some of that risk. Now, we've got newer research as well building off of this showing that um, suicidal ideation is actually multidimensional. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we think about suicidal ideation as thoughts about death or thoughts about ending one's life, but suicidal ideation actually includes all these like sub-elements, like the wish to live, the wish to die, um, uh, the, the extent to which um, a person um, is willing to remove themselves from a life-threatening situation, uh, the, the specificity of planning, their perceived um, confidence or courage um, and our fearlessness about death. And all of these different aspects of suicidal ideation change in different ways at different times, um, such that we have uh, these newer ways of understanding um, how a person's risk can actually evolve over time, but critically, that can help us to better understand how suicide risk can resolve. Um, perhaps there are patterns that signify reductions in risk recovery from suicidal states, even though someone might continue to express or experience some form of suicidal desire. Another, another way um, that we've been trying to get around this problem of uh, poor reliability and suicide risk screening is to look beyond our traditional definitions of suicidal ideation. Um, and, and again, the, uh, sort of the, the predominant way that we approach this in clinical um, and even outside of clinical settings is to ask people, are you having thoughts about suicide? Do you want to end your life or some other iteration of that concept? Um, but multiple studies now show that there are different ways that we can capture suicide specific thought processes that do not explicitly ask about suicidal ideation. Um, so the research that we've been working on for several years now, as an example, involves a suicide cognition scale. The suicide cognition scale does not explicitly ask about suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Nonetheless, scores on these scales and items actually outperform um, our traditional suicide risk screening methods, including the PHQ-9, the scale for suicide ideation, and the Columbia scale. Uh, we've, we've been working on different iterations of this that might be of uh, differential value if you're in an outpatient therapy setting versus now um, newer data coming out in a few months, actually, that a single item from the scale when used in primary care does better than asking about suicidal ideation. And we can start combining 
the suicide cognition scale with our traditional methods of asking about suicidal ideation to capture what seems to be a broader spectrum of suicide related thoughts. This is another reason why I think screening misses about 50% of those who attempt suicide or die by suicide. In essence, we're asking the wrong questions. Um, at the time that someone is being screened, they might not be experiencing suicidal ideation as we have traditionally defined it or as we have traditionally asked about it. Um, it's also possible that many suicidal individuals do not feel comfortable disclosing those thoughts um, to healthcare providers, being afraid of what might happen if they admit the suicidal thoughts. And so being able to capture a broader spectrum of thought processes and mental activity that are highly specific to suicidal behavior could potentially solve this recurrent problem that we have of poor performance amongst our existing screening and assessment methods. Now, a third uh, a concept that I want to talk about is uh, involves some of the ways that we approach short-term acute uh, risk management for suicide risk, uh, which I, I would argue this trend in healthcare settings um, over the past few decades to adopt more forms and more paperwork and more administrative tasks. And uh, some of the work that I'm most directly involved with include short-term acute risk management strategies like safety planning or crisis response planning um, and how these are often adopted in routine clinical practice versus how they were originally designed and intended for use. So on the right hand side here, I have several examples of a crisis response plan. These are from actual patients that I've seen over the past few years. Uh, the crisis response plan is typically handwritten on an index card. It's, uh, it's right now, it's the only um, single session uh, suicide risk management intervention uh, that's supported for the reduction of suicidal behavior and randomized clinical trials. Um, on the left-hand side, you see uh, a safety plan template. Probably many of you are familiar with this. Um, these forms and templates have been around for years. They're now widely used in many agencies um, and institutions. Um, interestingly, what we're finding is that uh, new research shows that clinicians, when they use these strategies, um, often do not construct high-quality safety plans or crisis response plans. And it's typically because they have not received suitable training in how to use and develop these strategies. And what ends up happening is, um, I think a lot of times institutions and agencies adopt forms um, and then require clinicians to use the forms without actually providing any instruction or training on how to use the technique or intervention to maximize its effectiveness. And so uh, there was a, a clinician uh, just a couple of weeks ago in a training workshop I was conducting who I think really um, kind of encapsulated this problem very nicely. And I was, uh, I was really struck by his um, sort of earnestness and frankness about uh, the problem. What he said is, oh yeah, we've been doing the, the safety plans and using these forms for years. Um, but really the way that we were taught to do it is um, when we have someone who comes to the ED or they're being discharged from our inpatient unit, you know, we just sit down with them, we fill out this form, we spend just a couple minutes doing it. Um, and then we give them the form, we put a copy into the health, uh, the medical record. Um, and that way, we, if the patient kills themselves later on, the lawyers come asking, we can point to the form and say, no, we filled out the form. So we did everything that we need to do. Um, and what this clinician added was that I actually had never heard of, uh, you know, using these strategies as an intervention, as something to do with a patient that could actually reduce their suicide risk. I was just under the impression that this was a risk management uh, legalistic requirement uh, to protect the agency or institution. Um, and so I think this is actually a, a pretty big problem right now in uh, the healthcare system, um, where we oftentimes focus on administrative and paperwork based tasks because it serves theoretically to protect the clinician or the institution. Um, but the actual training and education involved in using these tools in a very effective way to actually reduce the risk of patient suicide um, is much more time consuming. It's harder to do, it's more costly. Um, and so it's 
it's easier to just do forms as opposed to changing how we actually practice and interact with um, higher risk patients. Okay? Uh, there's some newer research coming out as well, incidentally on this, where um, they've uh, uh, surveyed uh, mental health professionals working in a variety of settings and what they found was that almost all of the mental health professionals surveyed um, had heard of crisis response planning or safety planning. Um, they endorsed that they uh, were using it, they had used the forms, they were familiar with the concepts. Um, nonetheless, the majority of those mental health professionals also said, I actually don't really know how I'm supposed to do it. So I do it, I use it, but no one has actually showed me what to do with it so that I can be most effective with patients. Um, so we, again, we need to seriously, I think, reconsider how we are implementing or instituting um, a lot of these interventions, because I think one of the risks that we run is that many of our patients then who receive these interventions when they're not delivered in a high quality and effective way, um, they come back to our systems and they start rolling their eyes and rejecting the interventions because it's just that form that you guys fill out with us all the time. Uh, the last concept that I want to talk about is uh, this, I, I think uh, one of the bedrocks of suicide prevention, which is that um, suicide is caused by or results from mental illness or from uh, mental health conditions. Um, therefore, uh, the best way to prevent suicide is to refer people for mental health treatment um, and, to and to treat uh, their various mental health conditions uh, or their diagnoses under the hope that by treating mental health conditions, then suicide risk as a presumed symptom of mental health conditions will actually resolve. Um, even though that is, I think, a central assumption of most uh, suicide prevention approaches, uh, there's actually not a whole lot of data um, to back that up. Um, and I would argue that perhaps we, we actually don't need to rely on mental illness models of suicide in order to make a big difference when it comes uh, to preventing suicide. So um, I have here uh, national trends and fatality rates. Um, I, I wish this were the trend line for suicide, but of course it's not. Suicides have been increasing since 1999. Um, this is the trend line for a different type of unexpected fatality, um, which is traffic accidents. Um, so we see here starting in the 1950s, as cars and motor vehicles became increasingly prevalent, uh, more and more um, US citizens and adults owned cars, people were driving longer distances, uh, more people were on the roads, uh, there was uh, an increase in traffic fatalities, which makes sense. Yeah, there should be a correlation, more cars, uh, more time spent in cars, we would expect um, overall to see an increase in fatalities related to motor vehicles. Um, in the 1970s, though, we start to see a reversal of that trend. And since then, there has by and large been a reduction in uh, traffic fatalities in the United States. And this, this has occurred despite, again, again more cars, more, uh, uh, more driving distance um, in the United States. And so there, um, even though in many respects, we should be seeing an increase in traffic fatalities because we spend more and more time driving than we have ever before, we have seen a reversal of that trend. Um, and this, this trend, this reduction, I'll note, has largely occurred um, not because we've educated drivers about the warning signs of impending traffic accidents, um, and not because we've encouraged drivers who show these warning signs um, to sign up for driver's ed classes so that they can receive an intervention. Okay. Uh, we've taken a very different tactic and approach. Uh, yes, we do encourage people to sign up for safe driving classes. We also incentivize those people by typically doing things like charging them lower insurance premiums. But we've largely adopted strategies uh, that have nothing to do with driving skill and or the characteristics of drivers themselves. Instead, we have focused on things outside of the driver. 
that reduce the likelihood of an accident occurring. And if an accident cannot be avoided, we've taken steps to improve the likelihood of survival. So in essence, we've made traffic accidents less dangerous and less lethal. Now, I think what's kind of interesting about this is that we don't actually spend a lot of time or resources trying to predict which drivers are going to get into car accidents and which drivers are going to die in a traffic fatality. We also don't try to predict when a traffic accident is going to occur and then trying to convince those drivers who've been identified through these algorithms uh, to sign up for driver's ed classes or have some other kind of intervention. What we've done instead is we've changed the world. We've essentially made it harder for drivers to die when they get into a traffic accident. We've done things like we install road signs, we have traffic lights, we have speed limits, we've criminalized drunk driving, we've installed guardrails and airbags, we've designed crumple zones in our cars, we have seatbelts and require people to use the seatbelts. These are all strategies that have dramatically reduced traffic fatality rates without actually doing anything to change the skill or the ability of individual drivers. And so this, this approach that we've taken with traffic fat fatality reduction is called prevention through design. In essence, we design the system in a way to change the outcome that we're hoping to change. Now, prevention through design is based on the core assumption that the most effective ways to prevent illness, injury, and mortality involve strategies that focus on the hazardous conditions themselves. Um, so perhaps unsurprisingly, the most effective strategy to prevent injury or death is to remove or to eliminate completely the thing that is causing the harm, the thing that creates the injury um, or the fatality. If that thing cannot be completely removed from the environment, then the next best strategy is to replace that hazard with something else that's less dangerous. That other thing might also be kind of dangerous, but it's much less dangerous than the original hazard. Sometimes we can't replace that thing, that, that source of hazard. In that case, we then take steps to place barriers between people and that hazard to try to keep people away from the danger. If though we cannot separate people from the hazard, then we try to change people's behaviors. We do things um, to alter how people are acting on a day-to-day -day basis to reduce their exposure to that hazard. Then finally, the least effective strategy is to issue personal protective equipment to people. This last strategy is the least effective because the hazard remains present. It's still there. It can still cause harm. It can, it's still dangerous. Um, but And we have to hope and rely on the usefulness and effectiveness of the personal protective equipment and also we have to hope and keep our fingers crossed that people use that protective equipment reliably and correctly, right? And so how might this design, uh, this prevention by design approach apply to suicide prevention? Well, I would argue that um, right now our most commonly used and sort of status quo go-to strategies tend to be the least effective. Um, so, for example, we do a lot of anti-stigma campaigns and public messaging around um, encouraging people to get help. That's akin to the process level where we try to change people's behaviors. Um, we also do a lot of resilience training or um, encouraging people to seek out mental health treatment from a healthcare specialists. That would, in many ways, be akin to the personal protective equipment level. Um, and I say that because because, you know, treatment and fostering resiliency um, and addressing stigma certainly does help, um, but in many cases it doesn't actually address the hazards that exist in the environment that are contributing to or, or placing strain on the person. Things like financial strain, um, discrimination, uh, employment or workplace burnout and bullying. And so mental health treatment, for instance, medication or therapy 
can be really helpful. It can help buffer and protect people against those various hazards, but it ultimately doesn't necessarily pay the bills. Um, it doesn't help them or doesn't prevent them from being evicted uh, from their homes. It doesn't change the illness or uh, the health condition of a sick loved one or eliminate one's debt or remove that toxic boss or supervisor um, in the workplace. And so what ends up happening is we conceptualize suicide primarily as a problem of mental illness, as something within people. Um, it's this form of pathology at an individual level that's inside of us, and we need to find it. And we need to screen for it and identify who has those forms of pathology, and then we need to treat that. We need to get rid of that pathology or somehow strengthen other protective factors within the individual uh, to buffer against against um, that pathology. Um, and so this, this approach to suicide has served as a justification for many well-intentioned, uh, but ultimately futile suicide prevention and psychological health promotion programs. Um, and so just as we've done with traffic fatalities, I would argue that we need to look beyond the individual. We need to look for ways to prevent suicide by redesigning our systems and redesigning our communities. And so what might that look at? like if we were to address or start to adopt these higher levels of a prevention by design approach? There are many different ways that we could look at this. We should uh, and could address social and institutional factors that impact financial security um, or that uh, foster and promote a respectful and safe workspace. In essence, we can remove the hazard of economic insecurity, remove discrimination, remove these other psychological hazards from the environment, which would then reduce the press and strain on individuals who are subject to them. We can also take steps to replace hazards with less hazardous um, um, items. This is, I, I would argue, one of the key arguments for means restriction efforts. Um, a lot of the work and research that I do now focuses on firearm access, for instance, and a common concern or critique that I hear uh, from many people about that work is that, well, if someone really wants to kill themselves, you know, restricting or limiting their access to a firearm, they'll just find a different way to attempt suicide. Um, and, and what I would say is, first off, we actually the, the data don't support that. People typically don't substitute methods. Um, but let's say they do. Um, let's say they do switch methods. Um, if we restrict or limit access to a highly dangerous method, such as loaded firearms, and a person switches to another method that is less dangerous, um, although a suicidal act or suicidal behavior might still occur, the likelihood of survival is dramatically in increased simply by replacing one hazard with a less dangerous hazard. Um, we can also, I think, on the same topic, start looking at engineering solutions where we try to isolate or separate people from hazards. This is another sort of key fundamental principle behind some of our means restriction work, particularly around safe storage, um, use of gun safes, of gun locks, um, safely storing medications within the home, placing distance between people and uh, their preferred method of suicide. Um, in essence, making it more inconvenient for a person to act upon um, suicidal urges, which kind of introduces a, a sort of a different way of thinking about suicide prevention, where um, one approach that I think underlies most of what we've done is to stop people from trying to kill themselves, to end or avert suicidal behaviors of all forms. The idea being, if someone does not attempt suicide, then uh, by default, we, of course, would reduce fatalities by suicide. But there actually is a second way to prevent suicides, which is to reduce the dangerousness and lethality of suicidal behaviors. In the same way that we can prevent traffic fatalities by preventing traffic accidents, but if by chance we cannot prevent an accident from occurring, let's create systems and design the system such that when an accident occurs, we're much more likely to walk away from it intact. Uh, we can similarly potentially prevent suicides and lower uh, suicide rates 
by making suicidal behaviors less dangerous and less lethal. And so uh, to, to kind of sum up, uh, over the, the past, I would say, decade and a half that I've been actively involved in suicide prevention research, um, you know, I, I have personally seen uh, lots of um, institution implementation of strategies, including new screening tools, new assessment methods, new uh, forms, uh, new documentation templates, new interventions, new policies, new procedures. Um, all of these ideas uh, that have been instituted, um, but I'm not sure that much of those new strategies have really changed anything. Um, I, I worry a, a lot that we are effectively just rearranging deck chairs while the Titanic sinks. Um, and each time we rearrange the deck chairs, we say, ah, it's a new way of doing things, but it isn't actually fundamentally altering how we understand suicide and how we approach it. And so my hope um, is that we will follow the path of that, that was set for us by Abraham Bald um, to move beyond what is immediately in front of us, to stop uh, focusing on armoring up and strengthening the parts of the plane that seem to be the most vulnerable, when in reality, the greatest vulnerability and uh, the greatest advances in saving lives might come from looking at and focusing on the things that right now are invisible to us. Um, so uh, uh, to wrap up, um, here are some possible uh, future directions that I hope to um, see over the next uh, few years and uh, decades, where um, we adopt for real new suicide risk screening and assessment methods that move beyond explicitly asking about suicidal ideation and thoughts, um, and that also do a better job of capturing the true nature of suicide risk, that fluctuating nature. Um, I also uh, am hopeful that we will start moving towards research that is informed by more complex and nuanced questions, um, looking not just at what strategies are most likely to prevent suicidal behaviors, but who do those strategies work for, who are those strategies best delivered by, and when or where are those strategies most likely to be helpful. Um, and then finally, I hope that we as a, as, a, as a community and as well as a society start to adopt this prevention by design approach and start looking at social factors that contribute to suicide risk um, and start implementing strategies at a community and a societal level and start to shift away from our nearly exclusive focus on individual uh, pathology and mental health conditions. So I'll, I'll conclude there. I really appreciate everybody um, uh, joining today and uh, I'm happy if there's time left for discussion or questions, I'm happy to entertain any of those. Thank you so much, Dr. Brian. That was outstanding. And uh, I'm Holly Caston, and uh, work here with uh, Dr. Brian as uh, Director of uh, Community Education and Outreach. We just have a few minutes uh, for a couple questions. Uh, and um, here's the first one. Uh, most of us have learned that 90% of those who die by suicide met criteria for mental illness. Is that not accurate? Um, yeah, uh, so actually I, I talk about this in the book. I have a whole chapter called the 90% statistic. Um, and it is, it's based on psychological autopsy methods, but there's a lot of reason to suspect that the uh, psychological autopsy method is biased. Um, and there is some evidence. So that, that statistic comes from a study conducted by Kavanaugh and colleagues a few decades ago. If you look in that same um, paper, they, there are some psych autopsy studies that include case controls. So people who died of non-suicide um, causes. And what they found was that the diagnosed rate of mental health disorders or mental illness in the non-suicide cases are about twice what we would expect from epidemiological data. Um, and so uh, there does seem to be an overestimation of uh, mental health um, uh, disorders amongst uh, those who died by suicide. And another quick question. Do you think that the focus on mandated screening is actually compromising 
the development of better assessment and management techniques, especially in busy inpatient ambulatory and ED settings? Uh, so yes, um, I, I think there are some settings where it makes sense um, to do uh, like universal screening, and then there are other settings where indicated screening, I, I, I think, is more appropriate. Um, and yeah, I've, I've certainly found in my work um, training and consulting with different healthcare agencies um, that oftentimes the there's so much focus on forms and screening that a lot of times healthcare providers um, often will report, you know, I don't have enough time to actually do some of these other things. Um, and I've, I've even observed in some of, I, I occasionally do like uh, quality of care, negligence, uh, legal case consulting, and it's something that I'm seeing there as well, where um, the, the administrative requirements um, being imposed in healthcare systems it may actually be interfering with the delivery of evidence-based effective treatments. It's, it's, the focus is on filling out forms and paperwork, um, and it's not creating enough space for clinicians to do the things that would actually prevent suicide. Um, I saw Dr. Fawn raise his hand. Did you want to say something, Dr. Fawn? No. Thank you. It's a mistake. Great, great okay. discussion so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Craig, I just wanted to give you a quick chance to um, say something about your book. Uh, people are asking about it. Um, I also want to mention, and specifically, uh, how to purchase it. Oh, I see right there. Um, Tammy put up on the screen uh, how the link so people can purchase it. But I also wanted to announce that we are having Dr. Brian sign five copies of his book, which we are going to uh, mail out to five lucky conference attendees as a special gift uh, for attending today. So we're going to do a drawing uh, after the conference. So that's going to be a, a, a special prize for five of our attendees. But Craig, if you just wanted to say something uh, short and sweet about the book and why, why you did it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was um, uh, what one thing I guess I should say is I, I believe they've uh, delayed the release uh, until November, uh, but it is coming out soon. Um, but uh, the, the, the key aspect of this why was um, I was very strongly recruited to write this book uh, because of ideas contained in it, um, I had been starting to talk about a lot more and um, and a, a lot of the, these ideas were strongly influenced by personal experiences working as a psychologist, my time serving in the military, um, but also the research that we do. Um, and so what I was hoping to do was to not just have this be like a scientific uh, textbook, but also something where the stories of people who um, have gone through some of our treatments, uh, the stories that many of us have had that sort of defy um, a lot of our traditional assumptions to help demonstrate a lot of these concepts. So, uh, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share that with you. And I hope that uh, anyone who buys it finds it to be um, an engaging and stimulating book. Thank you so much. So this brings our Q&A session to an end. On the screen, you see the QR code for the speaker survey. You can use the code to complete the survey or wait to receive the email that will be sent to you with a link. We're halfway through the conference, ready to break for lunch. We're asking that you please return a few minutes early as we'll begin promptly at 1230. As you have for each session, you'll access the event navigation page and click on the session new directions in firearm suicide prevention. Enjoy your lunch. Thanks so much.